Hello everyone, my name is Kim Fournay. I am the CEO and founder of Saxo Bank. Today, uh, it's with great pride that I'm uh, hosting Henrik Andersen from Vestas. Uh, and Vestas, as you may know, is the largest wind power company in the world, uh, delivering sustainable energy solutions. Vestas is a dominant player, but it's also a Danish company. And actually, it's not that often we have that big uh, Danish companies uh, around. And as the world needs sustainable energy solutions and we have significant climate changes and so forth, this is on everyone's uh, uh, mind these days. And uh, actually, also seen from an investor perspective, Vestas is a very interesting company. It's actually the eighth most uh, traded stock in Saxo Bank Universe, and we have more uh, around uh, 50,000 different uh, instruments to trade. The, the first seven stocks are actually American, and uh, for our uh, around 800,000 clients uh, globally, uh, it's of huge interest. We have around 600 billion Danish kroner uh, from uh, clients, and a lot of those are already trading uh, Vestas uh, because of uh, the climate change, because of the whole agenda. And today we're gonna hear a lot more from uh, Henrik Andersen uh, about what, what that really means. The wind has always been shaping the landscape, moving people and their minds. At Vestas, wind means the world to us. It's all we do and why we know wind better than anyone. Our knowledge and commitment to wind make us who we are, the leader and pioneer of the wind energy industry. But we're in a race and need to be even better. A race to provide energy in the most profitable and sustainable way. We want to win this race. It will take hard work and dedication, and we will face resistance and rough patches, but we have never and will never quit, because we are Vestas. Together, we've achieved great results across the globe. We can proudly claim to have installed more turbines than anyone else, and that we monitor and service more turbines than anyone else. But we strive for even more, and we'll find the answers today for the questions of tomorrow to the benefit of our customers and our planet. That's what a true leader does. Welcome to Saxo Talk. Today with the CEO of Vestas, Henrik Andersen. Henrik will be joined by Peter Garner and I, and we will have a fireside chat about the renewable energy, but also try to raise some of the issues that we all have in this transition towards green. Welcome to both of you. Thank you Henrik, visit. let me start with a soft question for you. The, as a CEO of a global green energy company, what are your main sort of strategy views today? I think uh, for, us, uh, for us to be relevant, it has to be global. Uh, because the uh, choices of us uh, is to become the strategic tool for a lot of uh, political and also business leaders around the world in that journey towards carbon neutrality, or at least in the first uh, step here, the carbon reduction and then also the switch to more renewable. In that matter, we have to be global. Uh, so that's the, that's the first priority. Second priority is that we are relevant in both uh, the markets of onshore and offshore and also how to look for the assets for the lifetime, which is typically 30 years plus. So that's the, that's the two main reasons, very much follow the customer globally. And there's also a big story for you, I think, on the not only being part of the solution on the electricity generation, but maybe also a few words on your ESG initiative and how you see that uh, being part of the, not only the solution for you internally, but also towards the clients. Yeah, and I will be, as I said here, uh, honestly goes a long way for, for what we do because we have been around for four decades. And when we came to uh, just entering into to 2020, we, we, have, we, have, we have been always been blessed with having probably the world's most sustainable product in reality because a, a normal turbine of Vestas uh, being built will become carbon negative or carbon neutral after four months. 
So four months lifetime, it has basically compensated all of the steel and the various raw materials and the manufacturing we do to the turbine. So it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible sharp in, in four months to do that. But of course, the goal has to become that it's day one. So when the turbine is up, it's carbon neutral and then it's carbon negative for its, its rest of a life. And that's the journey we're on in the ESG side. And Peter, if you look at the industry from an analyst and an investor's perspective, what is it you see when you see Vestas uh, in particular, but the overall green transformation theme? I know we at Saxo have had a huge focus on this since Q1 last year. Yeah, we created a green transformation basket where Vestas is part of the win segment, the category. And we were stunned about the performance and the change in investor appetite and sentiment on the green transformation. And you have, of course, experienced that as well rising share price and valuations. And then when we came into 2021, we basically said, we think we are beginning a journey now of separating quality from, we called it junk, that may be a harsh word, but basically separating into a tier one and two, a tier two class of green companies. Is, how are you seeing that uh, transition? No, I think we, uh, we, I think, and this, this is probably uh, for us, we're both as executives and I've been uh, around as a, as a board member of, of Vestas First uh, since 2012 under unfortunately circumstances of financial distress of Vestas. I think the industry has for a long time lived off that the purpose is phen phenomenal. I mean, mm -hmm. every company in this industry will from uh, uh, engaging uh, both customers uh, contractors and, and partners and also our uh, employees will have an enormous strong purpose. But as I always say, purpose comes fantastic, but it does link 110% to that you also have to create value. Mm. Because if those two disconnect, then we got uh, either a, a group of singing uh, uh, optimists over here, and then we got somebody trying to recover a, a, a real poor financial situation over here. And I think that probably from an industry point of view uh, has led to, and I, I go now at a sector or industry wide point of view, that, that a lot of people talking about what could happen beyond 2030. And for me, that's, that, that doesn't work like that. Oh. For me, it's, it's, it has to be that you perform and we mitigate and we perform hard every quarter. That is giving you the license to talk about 2030. And that's how we run investors uh, very much. In terms of uh, when we when we look at the uh, investor appetite, I'm sure you are surprised as we are. I mean, when we launched this uh, green transformation, we were the one one odd out in terms of uh, actually committing to this task. Of course, uh, history then shows that uh, three quarters later, everyone was on the same boat and ESG became elevated to, to new heights. I know that you as a company also operate uh, what is called Vestas Ventures and maybe then utilizing your your investor hat into mm -hmm. ventures, you must find it very, very expensive to buy a little nudge of some of the industries, number one. So tell me about how you see the valuation when you engage uh, Vestas Ventures. And secondly, talk a little bit about what you yourself as a company has invested into, because I think that to some extent, at least for me, will direct me towards how you see the world in terms of uh, the evolution. Yeah, and we, we, when we created Vestas Ventures, it, was, it, it probably opens up for, for two, two ways traffic uh, to some extent, because uh, you would appreciate we have worldwide engineering teams working constantly on optimizing technology. And as part of optimizing technology, they tend also to find ideas that potentially will be borderline. Or at least if I was looking at it, we spent, uh, this year we will spend approximately a, a billion euro in uh, capex uh, and if we look at that that will actually boost our capex and we wouldn't be able to invest enough to give the business enough life so it's also intended that Vestas ventures could be the part owner of an idea that needed a leverage and a co-investment from the outside world but in the beginning here it is right that we have said let's try to open it up and that's where maybe i cheat your multiple uh, fear a little bit because of course we then invite partners to come and talk to us uh, from all areas, all areas of the turbine, which sits, could sit around the data or the optimization. But as we saw recently, we invested in Motvian, which is a Swedish company that is right now uh, innovating around a tower in wood rather than in steel. And we then uh, just a week ago, we announced also we invested in a company, Salamander, 
who are using a new technology in, in, in the crane and therefore building higher with a more flexible crane construction. Um, and of course, for us to invest in those, uh, the good thing with that is we then put technology and engineering and heads, good heads together. Um, and then at the same time, if it works, we of course, <laughs> with the largest annual capacity of turbines, uh, the company there will have a very large customer from day one. So there is a, here is a also from a Modvian and other companies, if we really have a breakthrough, you got the world's largest wind turbine maker as a customer day one. So there's a, there's a different fly into the Vistas Ventures. Um, and we wouldn't go out and invest in, in borderline things or solar or something. So we invested uh, into storage, which is also a small invested in the early days. Um, and there will be some smaller investments, for instance, also into the power to X. So Henrik, I, I'm going to ask Peter to actually ask you a question, which I know we internally have discussed. So the power X or I, I think if I look at your results, it's pretty clear it is very successful. But it's also true that the amount of new business is coming slightly down, mm -hmm. uh, I think would be the way to phrase it, which concerns me as an environmentalist, uh, if you take it that way. Talk to us about the uh, political will and the stubbornness of which we don't see action behind all of the great narratives that the world has today. And, and I think Peter will then have a little bit of a question on, of course, that to some extent creates a barrier in your ability to be fuel, fully utilized in the grid system. Yeah, I think it's here for us. Uh, it, it seems like we like talking about it. Uh, and I think if you are politicians, you probably like talking more about it than, than generally we will do if we are business leaders. Uh, I tend to be quite direct in saying, uh, for instance, the climate evidence, come on guys, it has been here for a decade. For somebody to suddenly say, now we got another round of floodings, we got another round of wildfires, now we have to act. So I think it's here and, and, and the tools to address it are here. And the financial costs, levelized cost of energy of the renewable tools today are cheaper than the existing ones. So there is no financial, there is no other excuse than to start getting it done. So this is about now finding the political will to show that your intent and your rhetoric turns into practical permitting and getting the transition going. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the nail on sort of or hard on or head on the nail right now, it is that part of getting the rhetoric to permitting. Yeah, we, we and I looked at the, the numbers and from the, the uh, IEA and uh, wind, uh, wind and solar renewable segment is the fastest growing energy source. If you look at electricity generation by fuel, just surpassed and think in 2020, more than 10% globally. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the fastest growing and it has been growing for wind for 15% per annum for two decades. Mm -hmm. Is that your working assumption as well, that we'll keep you know, getting that 15% because that means that the wind capacity doubles every four, th four year. Is that, is that the working assumption for, uh, for the next decade? Yeah, and I think uh, here, I wouldn't say it's the working assumptions across uh, the total market because as we, as we say, we have an onshore which probably from a very high 2020 will grow between one to three, one to four percent with separate countries taking different uh, stand. I think there is an acceleration right now and priority uh, right now that, that, that leans toward. I think on the offshore, you could easily see a situation where you'll actually have an offshore that grows plus 25 percent. Uh, from 25 and onwards, because with the lead time now, we have UK, we have Japan, Korea, China, we have US that are all embarking in to a much higher pace of, uh, of offshore. And that only takes three or four per permitting, and then you have committed another three, four gigawatt of offshore. So this is big business. Great news. Okay, Henrik, we are now going to the future of renewable. So if I took on my skeptic hat, I would say, Henrik, it's fine. You do 10%. You are on a world-class operation. But, you know, the grid system is not following through. The uh, political narrative remains one that we want to do things. But, you know, the commitment in terms of the U.S. In, in, on, on infrastructure to build out is very small. So first up, you know, if you had all the political will in the world, 
how would the world look like? Let's start by Europe, because I also want to take you into the German election. Yeah. No, I, as I said here, um, I think it's, it's sort of always, uh, first of all, we will never get that uh, full, uh, full uh, uh, will and, and power to go hand in hand. But, but I think here, uh, I always say it's the stop and go we need to avoid. Because the worst thing that can happen in this transition is that you have, and, and I will just say, fourth year election, which we love because it's our democratic right, but it also triggers a, a, a normal stop and go in terms of either political direction, speed of the decision making, and, and probably worse than this, the transition here is not about uh, existing uh, fuel and new fuel or existing uh, electricity or new electricity. This is about getting a two decades commitment to do the transition, because otherwise we will, ex we will actually experience blackouts. The, the grid has to be upgraded over two decades, but also the transition of the renewable uh, up and the fossil and the coal and the nuclear down is going to take us a couple of decades. And, and for most politicians, they don't have two decades. They have four years, and that's the, that's the difficult part. For a business like ours, we think a decade ahead. We think two decades ahead, uh, but we also think here and now. So that's the, I think that's the, that's the challenge in the decision making. I would like to make it specific and then leave it for Peter to ask some, some technical questions on the, on the, and the distribution of utility. But uh, I know both of us are, are watching the German election with very, very carefully. Uh, our, not that it's worth anything, but our view is on the 27th of September, Europe changes because Germany changes. Yeah. Uh, and what we're talking about, of course, is the fact that the Green Party is very likely to have a minor or a larger role. But I know, Henrik, you have some thoughts on what is already happening. And you also have, if I'm not putting words into your mouth, that you have some concerns about what happens when the election is over. Can you talk to that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, we, probably know the, we probably know that uh, when you have to be re-elected, you try also to catch, uh, first of all, the voting trend. Uh, I think for many of us, we've experienced in the last five years that that environment and the renewable part and sustainability has a bigger thing in the underlying any election around the world. Um, but in Germany here, for us, it's interesting to see that we have had a plan to change energy mix since 2015-16, but when we look back then, nothing has really happened in 17, 18, 19 and 20. So four years of hardly any auctions, hardly any permitting, and that means basically from a transition point of view, Germany has moved on average probably three to three and a half gigawatt behind their own goal setting. What has happened in those four years is the target was then more, they were increased even more, so actually the gap became even more without doing practical things. But I also know I'm positive on that one because 21, uh, we have has seen two auctions. The first auction was 54% undersubscribed because there was a lack of permitting. The second auction was one and a half gigawatt again, but it was only 24% underutilized due to lack of permitting. And there will be a third auction this year. But that means Germany could have done an auction process in 21 of four and a half gigawatt in total probably hitting, let's guess, 60, 65 percent uh, of, of usage. And that would be more in 21 than they have done in the previous four years together. So I, I'm sort of a little bit, if that's the future Germany, then I can promise you one thing. Then we have had one of our major and most important markets suddenly getting to live within 21. So for me, the end of September is all about continue that one, please. Yeah, one of the things we've talked about as well with the green transformation, um, you recently announced a new offshore wind turbine, which I looked at the specification, it's, it's remarkable. It's better than the general electric one they have. Um, Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you also showed that in your presentation. So the levelized cost of energy for offshore wind turbines, as of today, the median price is higher than onshore. I, I suppose with the new technology coming that, that, will, that figure will come way down. But still, I have had this discussion. So are we reaching a physical limit? And if we are reaching a physical limit on these offshore, how does wind compete with solar if solar can get even cheaper? I'm just trying to peek in your, in your mindset about what's the, what sort of the competitive forces between solar and wind on getting prices down even further. Yeah. 
I think, uh, first of all, I, I, as I said here, and then it, it, it's sort of been put together like it's a, it's a combination or it's mm. a competition between wind and solar, and that's, that's actually not the case. I think we have now shown and we have models and we have also demonstrated in a number of countries that where you are able to work with what we call the hybrids of solar and wind, that's probably where you get very close to the most efficient uh, energy source because you will then have, guess what, it's not always uh, sunshine, at mm. least not in Denmark, or the 24 <laughs> hours. And there's a lot of areas where you have these the sun, wind picks up when sun down, therefore you have a perfect. So this, this raises the question of how do we store it? But coming back to the offshore, just thinking from sort of the, the, the natural here, yes, we are crossing into the physical laws. Mm. But funny enough, every time we have built something that is that bigger than last time, everyone goes, oh, that's the physical laws. And then we push the physical laws and then we're there again. But 15 megawatt is a high power house mm. in itself. And the one thing that is positive in offshore is that you get removed from citizenship, you get removed from local things, but the expensive part of offshore, which is why more expensive is you have to dig into the seabed, you have to do the construction down and you have to do the wiring typically much more and much stronger in water into mainland and there you then have to distribute into the grid. So the next two things that will happen is that you will try to do the, for instance, the hydrogen production potentially at sea. So you don't, you avoid either transporting hydrogen to shore or electricity to shore and then start manufacturing hydrogen. And the second thing is, which you probably all heard of, half of the offshore planning right now goes to try to make it floating. Mm. And I think we all, at least uh, you and I, we are old enough to remember that, that <laughs> when we did the uh, early enough floating experiments in the oil sector, there was maybe a platform or two that was sort of... So all of the experience right now is to see how can we do floating? Because the floating takes one big advantage. You can tow your finalized turbine from harbor to sea. Mm -hmm. And right today, we do the construction when the platform is up, then you do it in sections. So you work at sea to construct your turbine. That means it's expensive. You have ships, design cranes, weather. weather. Mm. Everything goes against you. Where you, if you can construct it in harbor and tow it out, you will have an, a, a tremendous drop in levelized cost of energy. I know the critics right now are saying, ah, but it's going to be more. But that's because we haven't finalized the real technology on mm. the floating. So that's, that's, that's an upside. That's maybe at least for my curiosity something. So, you know, it must take a huge amount of, uh, I'll call it CPU, but IQ and, and uh, scientists. And how many scientists do you have working on just, you know, finessing the, uh, the blades and, and the turbines and the locations uh, in, in investors? Yeah, we have, a, we have a split of, we have a lot of core, uh, core research and development inside. Then we have a, a high number of partnerships. Uh, with technology universities around the, the world. And then we have a number of uh, technology and research partners that basically do part of, the, uh, part of the work as well. So what we say, ground technology and new models will all be in-house investors, but you will be contributing to parts of it. Uh, and that goes into the thousands of people uh, working on it. And, and as I said, we, we got pretty, pretty well covered for some of the most uh, most sophisticated models, but also test when you want to test the physical laws, you want to have people that know about the test of the physical laws, because we generally say uh, every time we introduce a new platform, it costs several hundred million of euros to build tests. Uh, and between idea, technology and prototype, we typically work uh, up to three years uh, before a prototype is up. And then from a prototype, to mass manufacturing, typically another two years, and then you are talking about delivery uh, into site. So it's a it's a long process. So what's going on now with the next uh, big turbine? Again, better than DE. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but I think actually this is a good lead into to my other questions because when I look at Vestas and everything you have said, it sounds extremely complicated actually to create a modern wind turbine, and I think that raises the bar, the entry barrier into the industry. So. I, I guess we probably look into a future with a consolidation and maybe a handful of maybe only three large players that dominate the market. For me, I've seen many industries as an equity analyst, and that typically leads to higher margins because you can more easily set prices. When I look at Vesta's numbers today, 
it is still a very thin margin business, right? I think the growth margin is 15%. You have an aim of 10% uh, operating margin. How far can investors go uh, from here on? What, what does it take to take investors to 15% operating margin? Because it, to me, it sounds like, you know, the technology makes it easier to compete, right? You know, not everyone can follow. Not, you have, don't have any new entrants. I always love when, uh, when people ask me about how to get to 15, because, yeah. because I need to get to 10 first. <laughs> uh, but, but, but as I said here, I, I think there's, there's two things right now. Most of the tools uh, for getting to 10% we have yeah. available ourselves. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not the ones that will sit around and, and look for, 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 for things to be either found or we have, a, we have an, quite a n number of it. Part of it is the technology. So we now embark into modularization, which you know from at least both car and trucking industry, mm. uh, gave them a real uh, thing and a real drive and probably also forced the consolidation in that industry because the ones that were best at modernization got a technology lead and a profit lead which led to a consolidation. Uh, on the other hand, we also do everything we can because imagine investors as a 16 billion euro project business because we do projects more than 40 countries at any one given point in time. So we have to be exceptionally good in doing our own project business. When that then turns into the industry, I'm as concerned as ever that when you take orders, you know upfront you're not going to make money on. That I'm dead against. Mm -hmm. And we have a super robust process which probably came out of our 2012-13 experience of being nearly bankrupt. So, so if you want to get a project tested and below the threshold investors, you need to get three executive team members from, from my team uh, saying yes. And the upfront answer is no. And then when you try the second time, it's no. And <laughs> if you are, if you are courage, uh, courageous enough uh, on the third time, you either have to have found some incredible other value levers from the customer to other parts of Vestas. Uh, otherwise, the answer is still no. Mm -hmm. And that's, that discipline is not happening in the industry. And we can see that. Um, we have seen smaller mid-sized companies disappearing. And I think we're not finished with it in the onshore. There's still, uh, there's still more companies there to be challenged. I think in the offshore, you're right. There are three, uh, there are G, Siemens, Gamesa and us. Mm. And I think that will probably continue for the foreseeable future because the entry barrier is large. So you're, actually, you, you're indirectly pointing towards that the offshore will be a, a game changer for the wind industry and for business. It will, but uh, on the other hand, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when industry offshore number one, and we are not number one, says that he is, he is foreseeing an incredible price pressure, then uh, I always use the, the notion of don't shadow box yourself, mm. because actually don't talk the industry down, because you cannot do the technology investment and the local manufacturing if you are having a zero EBIT. That doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, so Henrik, I would be amiss if I didn't ask you about the weather and the weather impact, both on what it will do to the future of Vestas' uh, positioning of uh, mills, but I also know for a fact that you have probably, uh, like Carl Sperry is the best beer, you probably, has, uh, you probably have the best data on uh, weather around the world. So first question on weather. Um, and the most important one. The IPC, IPCC came out with a report. I agree with you that the, the conclusion was given up front, but, but have you seen anything in the last five years in the data you have that supports the, what is seemingly the notion that the Gulf uh, stream is slowing down and that is creating the pattern? And has that made you think differently about the data set you have in terms of uh, the weather itself? So like a comment on weather from you, Henry. Uh, I think uh, we don't need to say probably. We have the best weather f uh, data in the world because we are the one that have had it for longest. And the longer you have it and the more wide you spread it, the better it is. And therefore, our uh, database and super capacity in predicting where you should put your turbines, not just from a country or, or continent point of view, but also when you have chosen your area, how they should be in that area. And that's down to maybe 10 or 15 meters differently, uh, depending on how, uh, how things will be. So, so optimizing the turbine's position, incredibly important. But then at the same time, we have, we have a bit more than 50,000 turbines censored up. So we can at any point in time in, in more than 70 countries tell you how, not only how the weather is right now, but also probably what's coming because we got turbines in, in one of the other directions. 
Um, but the one hard learning right now is people seems to be waiting for now, there was a report on Monday, when will the next report? That's probably in four or five years, yeah, maybe, maybe we should wait and see if that has then gone a lot worse. It's here. <laughs> It's here. There's no. There's no need to talk about it. And 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 for me, the alarming point is probably that we have been again rhetorically talked about it, but not really taking the facts. Fact is, if it goes up with one percent, humidity increases with one eight. degree. One degree, and that's already happened. That means we got eight percent more humidity generally, and that causes probably some of the worst things because that gives us the that there we touch out in this weather we don't want. We, we now get thunderstorms, not thunderstorms, but thunderstorms that creates the flooding or the excessive lightning. And for us as a manufacturer on OEM, this is this is challenge because you and I know from playgrounds, I mean, lightning takes shelter, right? We just don't move a V236 15 megawatt into shelter, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the videos you will see uh, is also when a turbine stands in the middle of a thunderstorm, it will be hit by lightning. And, and then for us, there is certain limitations to lightning and how long it can sustain. But at some point in time, it moves out of anything the world has seen. And therefore, lightning can destroy something if there is enough of it. Um, so that's one of the things where we can see that the world has changed, not in 10 years, not in only in the last five years, but as we speak, uh, and it moves to bigger parts. So therefore, there will be bigger parts of the world uh, so it expands where the thunder and lightning will hit. So to make clear, what you're saying is that you've seen a clear change in the pattern. As the temperature rises, the uh, tail distribution or the tail risk of operating a mill increases significantly from the fact that humidity takes up the uh, propensity of seeing lightning and, and strikes. I think that is a massive uh, conclusion from that question. Sustainability is absolutely at the core of what we do. As investors, we have to do and expect more. It goes for us as employees, and it goes for every stakeholder to investors. Sustainability at investors means minimizing the environmental footprint of your activities. But it also means taking leadership in driving the change needed to achieve a more sustainable planet. The change to the sustainability uh, policy in investors is that we think sustainability in everything we do. To become sustainable in everything we do, we have committed ourselves to four goals. The first goal is to become a carbon neutral company by 2030 without using carbon offsets. The second goal is to produce zero waste wind turbines by 2040. The third goal is to become the most safe, diverse and socially responsible company in the energy industry. And the fourth goal is a world entirely powered by sustainable energy. We set a goal that is hard. We're going to challenge ourselves, but to win and be successful goes way beyond the 25,000 colleagues investors. It goes beyond producing sustainable products. It goes into the entire value chain. It means that we will need to address our supply chain, the raw materials that we use, the transport that we use, the companies that we partner with. We need to look into everything. We also look at how we are dealing with diversity and inclusion. That means how do we make sure that we are open to everyone. And uh, last but not least, you are safe, you can work safe, and you return safely to your families in the evening. That's really what that is about. Vesta's sustainability journey started a long time ago. Together with our customers, suppliers and employees, we are determined to make this world a more sustainable place. Okay, we need to talk about Vestas going forward 
as a start because everyone who's been watching this show is here because they want to know where it goes, Henrik. So I'm not going to make you predict. I won't give you any insight. And you were, yeah, and I know you're not going to give me any insight. But I'll start the other way around it and make Peter the, uh, the victim here and say, Peter, now you have to see your investors in front of you. What would you like to see from Vester? And what do concern you about Vestas as you look into the future? Well, I, I have seen many things in the equity market uh, over the past 15 years. And one thing is clear is that companies that have a very stable growth rate and potentially expanding their margins um, and also having a you know, 15 to 20 percent, at least 15 percent return on invested capital generates excess returns above the global stock market. So and then also stability in the margins. And, and, I, and I know that's where the services segment come in because I know investors have been talking for five, six years that the services, the after service market segment can sort of drive that stability in margins. Um, where do you see investors going forward on the services and getting the stability in the margins um, and getting to maybe 15% return on invested capital? I think uh, the 15% uh, return on, on capital employed is, is is something that is near and dear to us mm. uh, and and for people that also looks into the uh, incentive programs of executive management it has been a it has been a long uh, clear standing of that we are we are also remunerated when it comes to shares on earnings per share and return on capital employed and and, and market share mm. um, and for us uh, that is positive in so much as uh, put your mouth and your wallet the same place and then uh, get things done um, from a service point of view, I, I spent quite some time in the service business and there's one thing I always uh, admire, uh, that is the service technicians are doing a damn hard job to look after our turbines and our solutions. And it is an extended uh, performance of the energy solutions through that service technicians backed up by data and, and the technical uh, tools. So right now we're actually investing into the service business. We're giving every uh, service technicians a proper a handheld tool to be able to come around, do the, the job, but at the same time also have a direct link uh, back home to get the technical support. Um, I think this is one part of taking the technical service into not only year 2021, but towards 2030. Uh, and our service business is more than 12,000 mm, service technicians now. It's a, it's a plus 2 billion uh, euro uh, business. Uh, it has very high margins, uh, so some will always say, why, why don't you do more in service and less in turbines? But, but it doesn't work like that because our own capture, so when we take new orders now on the technology, we're also one of the ones that leans more towards 30 years, 35 years. So we, we allow new capital to come into the renewable space because a lot of the new capital wants to have operational safety hmm. and operational uh, transparency for 30 years rather than five years. So there's a huge difference between a utility and for instance, a pension or infrastructure fund that says, here it is, and I want to invest. And then he goes away and probably sell the electricity in an offtake to Amazon, Google, uh, Heineken, some of those, because that market is then exploding because suddenly private companies can now make an offtake of green energy. So quite an interesting uh, proposition there. But we know today it has to be the power solutions, it has to be the turbine that has to grow the profitability of where we are now. So, and, and in terms of, uh, again, the future, uh, we talked about Vestas Ventures, which is, you know, a, a, a slightly new uh, strategic initiative. Down the road, could we see that uh, in order to facilitate a, a better building out that Vesta goes vertical and become owner of, uh, of uh, windmill farms and, uh, and the likes? Henry? Nah, that, that, that we say clear no to. Uh, and that's because we probably had a, a bit of a, I wouldn't call it a venture because that gives the wrong uh, association. But when we, when we go back to end of, of the zeros and, and into nine and 10, I think we ended in a situation where we had partly uh, wind turbines and parks uh, partly on, on our balance sheet. And, and that's, not the right, uh, that's not the right thing for us. We are in a uh, pretty, uh, pretty intense cycle of, of, of capital, uh, uh, applying our capital into both technology and, and manufacturing. And, and there is an inherent risk that you become into a part where your balance sheet becomes inflexible. Mm. So all our capex should be in, 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 in the tangibles of our uh, manufacturing footprint 
technology and then we leave the ownership of the turbines uh, to our customers and customers and partners can be utilities it can be the end users but it could also very well be a company we teamed up with in in in, in ownership which is Copenhagen infrastructure partners because of course they make it possible for worldwide investors and pension funds to actually invest in pure renewable nothing else than renewable so this is this is for a lot of institutional investors a fantastic uh, vehicle to get in to have something that is banked booked 100% on renewable and of course for that they want good projects around the world and we are investors we are in 80 plus countries typically the first one to see it so we will be building co-developing that but immediately it gets permit and it gets allowed to be built there will be a Vestas turbine investor service operating contract on it and then they will be applied allowed to apply the capital from somebody else and that's where we put out of the ownership and the capital structure not, not that i expect you to answer uh, honestly uh, in, in in the true sense but so we talked a lot about consolidation and i think at least from from peter's eye chair there needs to be a massive consolidation uh, between good and bad projects i'm not saying win is, is is not part of the good one here but but do you in the immediate future see uh, you using your very high cash generation as, as, as a way to consolidate the industry yourself? Yeah, I think we have used uh, what we do. We have Vestas Ventures today. We, uh, we showed last year that we, uh, we did something coincidentally. It was in all in fourth quarter. We, we bought our 25% into uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners on the development uh, side. But probably more importantly, we re-entered with 100% ownership of the offshore business. That also means we have been in first quarter here integrating 3,500 new employees, um, colleagues, to some extent, some of them uh, old Vestas colleagues, but now coming back as uh, fully uh, part of the family. Um, I think up until now, we have very much taken a, a bit more the uh, approach when you look at consolidation, that somebody runs into the wall and, and let themselves go out of business. Uh, rather than necessarily helping somebody that is nearly up to it. Uh, because the, the unfortunate thing in, in, a, in a heavy technology industry, if you have lagged behind for out a period of time, that, that there, isn't a, there isn't a great investment. You, you do typically buy into a, a product portfolio that is marginal borderline, and then you have a service business that for us is, is, is interesting. So I think there is a, there is a little bit of... of, of tread carefully there um, but but I will say here would we participate in the consolidation yes we would would we see most of the cases if they come around yes we would um, so we will we will see but we are as you can see we're careful with our capital structure so if we buy something and we feel for it we issue shares if we feel that's the right thing otherwise we will do the normal dividends and share buybacks so uh, we fully understand the the, the value of having an earnings per share we can we can work with and increase. It's almost time to wrap up, but I want you to put you uh, uh, on a prediction here, Henrik. So not one specific to Vestas, but one. What's the uh, what's the proportion of wind in electricity generation by 2030, which is your own? You already said yeah. to me that you have that under full control, so I expect yeah. a very precise number for that. And and secondly. If weather on a scale to eight to ten is a five, what what is weather in your opinion from all the insight, the database you have, the lightning that we talked about, the humidity and everything else, is it uh, still at five or is it at ten as we look into the future? No, I I think on the on terms of electricity prediction, it's 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 totally subject to probably uh, the handful of the far, four largest. And you are rightly saying we're having a, a German election. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's minimum doubled. But then after a doubling of 7 to 14 percent of electricity generation in 30, then it's only a matter of what aggressiveness will we see and how fast will we will we see that one. And, and I could also easily work with something. But I'm also in a company where we say we are also quite careful of, of, of not taking people on this um, road where we take them into some of these scenarios because there's a couple of scenarios where evaluation becomes uh, a little silly actually uh, but but as i said I, I i come with both feet on the ground every morning and then we just execute on, on what we should do in terms of the weather i i i'm a little bit the one saying what you have seen up until now is nothing i mean we haven't moved we probably even haven't moved an instant 
between your four or five or five or six or whatever. What we are up for is what is should be feared. And, and I know maybe you and I won't even see it to an end because we will just see it as, a oh, that was another evidence. But I can bet you our kids won't forgive us because they will see the full effect and then it will start moving from a four to a seven. And when it moves from a four to a seven, there will be parts of either the globe or the year where it won't be safe to be. And that's not good. No. On that very positive note, Henry, uh, thank you for uh, your time, your great insights and, and uh, your openness to doing this. It's, it's been an absolute true honor for both Peter and I to have you uh, for this Saxo talk. So thank you and good luck. And uh, certainly from a personal level, I'm a big fan of Vestas and, and the journey you uh, have just started in your own words. Thank you, Henry. Stein uh, and Saxo and Peter um, and Kim as well, thank you for having me. And I think it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's a, it's a nice way of, of doing it, and I'm pretty sure we'll next time also trigger some more Q&A from the audience. So uh, really a pleasure. Thank you for having me.